Good evening. Good to see a few of you out tonight. I don't know where the rest of our group is, but uh, I guess that's the problem when we can't keep consistent with doing this every other week or so, right? And uh, But uh, we're glad you're here, and we're going to be in chapter 12 of Revelation tonight. Going to cover the whole chapter, which I know is new for you guys. Uh, it's one of those chapters that uh, we're basically just setting some groundwork, if you will, for where we're headed. Some of the information we've already discussed in, in and not in great detail, but we've discussed some of it. Some of it's going to be common knowledge to you, but it really is setting the stage for uh, what all is taking place here. It, it's sort of a, another one of those parenthetical teachings that just kind of brings you up to speed on who all is involved. We're going to uh, basically see tonight what we call four personages. Okay, so I'd like to begin reading at Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, down through the rest of the chapter and have you follow along, and we're going to look at these four personages tonight. Remember, John's been translated up into glory, and uh, he's seeing the last days uh, in the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is about the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? Chapter 12, verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. <clears throat> and she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to go to, uh, to be delivered, to devour her child as soon as it was born. And as she brought forth a male child who was to rule over all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place where, where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was there pleasure in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world, and was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice, or loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation, and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down who accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved, and they loved not their lives unto death. Be heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knows that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman who brought forth the male child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her first time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. And the earth held, helped the woman, and the earth, helped, uh, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his And the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony So this is basically on your in what's going on. Of course, the first reference there in verse one is to a woman, and that with the woman is who? Mary. Okay, and uh, Mary here is a representation. We're going to see in a minute 
a representation of two personages, one being Israel, the other being the church, which we talked about this we're talking about on Sunday mornings about the body of Christ, the church, his bride. Okay, so the personage of Mary kind of plays a dual role here. And you see most of this because this text in Revelation after chapter 3, remember we said the church has been raptured, I believe, into glory. And everything after that is about the, the Israel, not necessarily the church. But there are also applications throughout that you find that reveal the church. And this, I believe, is one of them. We're going to mention, talk about that in a minute. But I believe Mary here has ours. the woman of God is God's people. It was his chosen people Israel. Of course, he later gave them a writ of divorcement, as we know in, in, in the Old Testament. And then he's going to be married to his bride, the church, which is us, through eternity. And then he's going to restore Israel in the end, which is also part of this, this thing here. Okay, So Mary, I believe, represents not only the Jews, Israel, but also the church here, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes in a little more in depth. Then we see that she's being with child, and we know who's the child here? Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, Mary, obviously, the mother of Jesus, our Savior, God, his Father, born in, uh, you know, immaculate conception, if you will. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary and is a virgin and, and birthed Jesus Christ. And... Uh, a lot of, lot of spiritual uh, sim, sim, symbolism here. Her being travailing in birth and, and pain with, to be delivered. And I thought at the time, turn back to uh, Luke chapter 1. Actually, I think we need Luke chapter 2, come to think of it. I don't, th these are not in my notes. I'm, I'm ad-libbing here. Uh, Look at uh, Luke chapter 2, uh, when Simon blessed Jesus, when Mary and Joseph brought him into the, temp brought him into the temple. Let's start at verse 25 of Luke chapter 2. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon, or Simeon. And the same man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it was, what's that? It was revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death, before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, they took, Luke chapter 2, Carol? 220, I'm, I'm at 27 now, I'm sorry. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to lighten, a light to lighten the Gentiles, the glory of thy people. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken of, which shall be spoken against. Yea, the sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And you know, Mary is the one that, when you watch the depiction of uh, the, 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 the Christ, the passion of the Christ, Mary is the one that really took the beat, if you will, taking her son down off the cross, having been at the cross, watching the whole thing, and her son being crucified on that cross. And you can only imagine the heartache that she went through. And that's kind of what I see here as I talk about travailing and birth and, and the pain to be delivered. Uh, Mary being that mother, and yeah, I'm sure it was wonderful to be the mother of Messiah, but to watch what her son eventually went through to die on, on the cross and become the sins of you and I, Mary, Mary went through a, a lot of heartache. And uh, then we see in verse 3 here, there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a red dragon, and that's the personage of Satan, okay? And we're going to look at that in depth in a few minutes as well. But uh, the, player, the first player here is, is Israel and the church, 
represented by Mary, the mother of Christ. And then we have no, none other than Satan himself, okay? And we're going to talk about his fall and, and what he's involved in as far as this particular text is concerned. Then you keep reading back up at verse 2 and also down at verse 5. Mary brought forth the male child, and that's again Jesus, right? And we're going to look at verses 5 and 6 about when he was born. Uh, you know, verse 4 there, Satan was there to de devour him. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then about uh, him coming and ruling with a rod of iron and so forth. But the personage here is first is Mary representing Israel in, in the church, the second one being Satan, the third, third one being Jesus Christ himself. And then we also see in the battle that went on in heaven before all of this started was chap, verse 7 and 8, 7, 8, 9 here, this battle that went on between the angel Michael and Satan in heaven. And we're going to talk about that as well. So as we get into to, to this chapter, we're talking about four personalities here. Okay. And that's, that's the, the, the text of, of the entire chapter here. Chapter 12 is dealing with these four different personages, all right? So the first one is Mary, Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the Virgin of Israel. Uh, turn back to Luke chapter 1. She obviously was uh, in the lineage of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She was also uh, espoused to a man named Joseph, who was also in the lineage of of, of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, Luke chapter 1, we see uh, she was a virgin. Uh, let's start at verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art who art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she, when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered in her mind what manner of greeting this should be. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and she, he shall be, you shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Behold, thy cousin Elizabeth hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. But with God nothing shall be impossible. And so we see, uh, obviously prophesied back in Isaiah chapter 7, where the virgin was going to conceive and bear a son. We see here in, in Luke chapter 1 where the Holy Spirit birthed a son in, in Mary's womb. And uh, it, it, it's revealed here in chapter 12, verse 1, She's considered the woman clothed with the sun, all right, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head the crown of twelve stars. And I believe, again, this references the mother of Israel's promise, the crown of the twelve stars. Uh, basically, what you see here in a symbolic realm, turn back to Genesis 37. Mary represents Israel. Of course, Genesis chapter 12, God called Abraham, right? Told Abraham, follow me and I'll make you a great nation. And, you know, out of you, all the worlds will be blessed. And that's a reference to Jesus Christ being in the messianic line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Genesis chapter 12. But in chapter 37, we see the list of Jacob's sons, right? And uh, verses 9 and 10 make a reference here let's start at verse 8 <clears throat> and his brethren brethren said unto him shalt thou indeed reign over us this is joseph's dream remember and uh shall, shall thou reign over us or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us 
and they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it unto his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Now, Joseph here is a type of Christ. Okay? He, he ended up being the deliverer. Remember how he was sold into slavery into Egypt? And when the famine came, the family came, and, and Joseph basically delivered them. So Joseph here is a type of Christ. And notice the three references he makes here. He sees the sun and the moon and the stars. And then we see that same reference. Now, the, the reference here, Jacob is the sun, Rachel the moon, that's what their names mean, and the 12 stars are the 12 sons of, of, uh, of Jacob. All right? So that's the, the symbol, symbol, symbolism we hear seeing go, clear back to Genesis. Now we see it in Revelation chapter 12. Turn back to Revelation 12 again in verses 1 and 2. So the, the, the symb symbolism here is that Mary is the symbolic woman of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their 12 sons. Okay? Again, it says here that uh, the, period, period of the wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with, with the sun, which would be, of course, Jacob, the moon, which was uh, Rachel, and under her feet, upon her head, with the crown of 12 stars. And the reference there is the authority through the Word of God and the Torah, the law of God Almighty, and it's referencing basically the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, And of course, she birthed the son in verse 2, being with child, crowd, travail, and birth, and pain to be delivered. So we've got the genealogy of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all the way through to Mary. Jesus was born a Jew. His mother was a Jew. Uh, he fulfills all the Old Testament properties, the pro prophecies, first advent prophecies. I think there's like 118 of them that he fulfilled perfectly. Um, you know, again, I mentioned Isaiah chapter 7, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 14, where the virgin was going to conceive. He was born in Bethlehem, in Ephrata, which was prophesied, and on and on it goes. All right. So Mary here is a key player, and I believe that the first reference to her personage here is regarding Israel. She brought forth the, the male child in verse 5, who we know as Jesus Christ, right? And it says that he was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up before God. We'll get that, to that in a minute. But I also want to look at Mary regarding the church itself. Here's the 12 tribes of Mary, or of Israel, if you will, the 12 stars. Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Ishakar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. And those are all the sons of Jacob, number one. And number two, they ended up being the tribes of Israel. And you can follow that throughout the Old Testament. They were the they were the woman that God married himself to, basically, in, in the old to be his bride. And then of course we know they were they were uh, in, in they all kinds of infidelity and idol worship over the years, and God kept trying to restore them and deliver them and restore them, and finally he gave them a writ of divorcement. Okay? But Mary, at this point in chapter one in the chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 is the depiction of the mother that represents Israel okay being the woman and god used the 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 uh, gender of women of womanhood to describe his relationship with Israel he later uses it in the new testament to describe his relationship with the church and we talked we've been talking about that on sunday mornings uh, in the worship service we are the bride of christ as the church He's the bridegroom. So God uses those gender references uh, for, that, for that reason to describe both Israel and the church. All right. Uh, turn to Isaiah 51, or Isaiah 50, I'm sorry, verse 1. Israel was the rebellious wife. Isaiah 50, verse 1, we read, Thus saith the Lord, where is the bill of your mother's divorcement? whom I have put away, but which of my creditors is it 
to whom I have sold you. Behold, for your iniquities have you sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. Wherefore, when I came, was there no man? When I called, was there no answer? Is my hand shortened at all that I cannot re redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke, I will dry up the sea. I will make the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stink because there is no water and die for thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and I make sackcloth their covering. The Lord hath given me the tongue of, of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakeneth morning by morning. He waketh mine ear to hear like the lean, like, like the learned. The Lord hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned backwards. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. Off the hair. I hid not my face from the shame and the spinning. For the Lord God will help me. You, you get the picture here? This is Jesus Christ talking about the bride that his father had put, put aside. Okay? And he's going to eventually deliver her. That's what's happening in the entire book of Revelation from chapter 3, verse chapter 19, is Jesus Christ coming back to deliver Israel from annihilation. He still loves Israel. He still loves the woman in, Re in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Okay? Yes, he's turned, he, he turned his attention to the church, and we're his bride, and we're going to talk about that in a little more in depth in a minute. But Israel... One of the problems that we've had in Christianity over the years is Israel, a lot of Christians believe that God is done with Israel. And we're Israel. And that's not biblical. God did not replace Israel with us. It's not true. If you really look at it in glory, he's going to be married to both of us. We're all going to be the bride of Christ together. Because he's going to restore the remnant of Israel. Okay? Okay. Uh, when they become believers in Jesus Christ, guess what? They're now part of the bride. Okay? Because that's how you become part of the bride, is having faith in Messiah, their son. So the idea of Israel being lost forever is not true. And that's been something that's been promoted by the church for years. But, at the, you know, when going back to the Crusades, when the Christians went to, to the Holy Land and tried to convert the Islams and the Jews to force them to become Christians. And that's not the way it was supposed to be done. And unfortunately, Christianity got a black eye for that era. All right. But the reality is the Jew, a lot of the Jews are going to come to faith in Christ during the tribulation period. They are going to turn their lives back to Christ. And they become in glory, they're going to be part of the bride of Christ. Because that's how they become part of the bride of Christ. Okay. So uh, we need to, to realize that as Christians, God's not done with the Jews. Uh, they have a their their revelation is really all about them mainly not not the church after particularly after chapter three okay so then we have the 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 woman being symbolic of the church Mary birthed the Messiah that's our bridegroom she birthed our 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 Savior you can basically say that she's the mother of the church. Of course, Roman Catholicism, I believe it has exalted her to deity, which they shouldn't have done. But Mary does have a prominent place in Christianity. She is our spiritual mother, if you will, when it comes to birthing our Savior. She was the virgin that was chosen to birth Jesus Christ. She made herself available to go through what she went through so you and I could have a Savior. Okay, And I think that's worth something. She's the mother of the bride of Christ. Go back to Isaiah 62. And I think it's interesting how God gave us glimpses in the Old Testament of what was to come in the New Testament. Isaiah 62, beginning of verse 1. The Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord hath appoint, anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek, who has sent me to build up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, and to open the prisons to those who are bound. Now, does this text bring back any memories to you?
in the synagogue. Yeah, when Jesus began his ministry, he went in the synagogue in Capernaum and he opened up this text and read it. This was his first message to the Jews, which was the beginning of the church age, if you will. The times of the Gentiles began with this text. Okay, this is critical. And here it is. He's saying, I'm Messiah upon me. The Spirit is upon me to do what the church is going to do for the next 2,000 years plus. Okay? So this is the introduction to the church in the Old Testament in Isaiah 62. And look, look at what he says. We could spend a lot of time here, but notice that the Spirit of God is upon me, and I've got that me underlined in my Bible. That's Messianic, Jesus Christ. He, he, he basically claimed that when he opened that scroll and read Isaiah 60, 60, uh, 61 2 here. Because the Lord has appointed me to preach good tidings to the meek, and has set me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives. That's all what the church is supposed to do, right? Verse 22, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance. Now jump to 62 on. For Zion's sake, I will hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a lamp that burns and the nation shall see the righteousness and all the kings of thy glory. And thou shalt be called a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall not name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory to the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called, whatever that is, Hezebah. Hez and they, the land Beulah, and we sing Beulah land, right? We love that song. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over, her, over the bride, so shall God rejoice over thee. I have set a watchman upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, who shall never hold their peace day or night. Ye shall... Ye, ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence, and give him no rest till he establish and till he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength, surely I will no more give thee grain to be food for thine enemies, and the sons of the foreigner shall not drink thy wine, for which thou hast labored. But they that have gathered it shall eat it. And praise the Lord, and they that brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. And on and on it goes. Basically, what you see here in this particular text, and I believe it's tying together in Revelation chapter 12, is you're seeing the tying together of Israel and the church in the millennial reign. You know, the Bible teaches, and we're going to see this down the road in chapter 20, but the Bible teaches that when when Christ comes back and delivers Israel from annihilation at Armageddon. We're coming with him as the saints in glory. And it says that we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Who are we ruling and reigning over? We're going to be ruling and reigning over the nation Israel, the remnant that's saved out of the tribulation. There's going to be a remnant of Israel saved during at Armageddon that Jesus Christ is going to deliver from annihilation, and he's going to start a new kingdom called the millennial reign for a thousand years. The Jews are going to be on the earth, and they're going to propagate and repropagate the earth, and Christ is going to be their king, and he's going to sit on the throne of David. And it says we as believers coming back in glorified form are going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So what you really see is the bringing together of the Old Testament woman, Israel, with the New Testament woman, the bride of Christ, the church, together in the millennial reign. And that's what we're reading here in, in Isaiah 62, is the, is the fact that Christ had come in Isaiah 61, and he says, the Holy Spirit is upon me, and I'm going to rule and reign. And then in 62, it writes about us as the church, and we're going to look at it in a minute, okay? We are the ones today defending the Word of God, not the Jews. 
We're the one preaching the good news. The gospel's been given to the church. The Jews are no longer presenting a gospel that saves anybody. Okay? They're, 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 their religion is bankrupt at this point because they rejected their Messiah. And all their worship is worthless. But God is honoring the church. We're the watchmen on the wall. We're the ones preaching the word of God. We're the ones defending the faith. We're the ones that are being martyred for the faith of Jesus Christ today worldwide. Okay? So we're in this Old Testament. We're written about here in Isaiah 62. Okay? And so it's going to come together in the millennial reign. That's why I see here, you know, I did a lot of reading on this, and you, you take one camp and they, they say, well, Mary represents Israel. And then you see the other camp, and, and it's all about the church. But I don't see anywhere in the commentaries that I read where they put them together. Well, I'm sorry. I see both here. You know, Christ is coming back to deliver Israel. And, and, and he, she was his woman. But at the same time, we know that we're the bride of Christ, and he's delivering us. And in the millennial reign, he's going to bring the two of us together as one. And then in glory, once those Jews are finally raptured up into glory, we're all going to be in the, in the New Jerusalem together. So, you know, this, this division between Jew and the church and stuff isn't real, biblically. In God's mind, though, anybody that will serve Christ is his bride, is his, is, his, is his woman. Okay, so Mary really represents both here in the way I see it. Uh, She's clothed with the sun and the moon and the stars. We've already read about that. You know, we can talk about Christ being the light. We're the light today. If you're saved and you've got the light within you, we're the sun, the moon, and the stars. We're the, we're the, we're the, the, the light to the world, if you will, right? Of course, the, the stars can represent the 12 apostles of the New Testament that, that, that brought us the gospel of Jesus Christ and the mysteries of the church and all of the stuff that we teach as, as Christians, okay? The apostles, we had 12 of those, just as they had 12 uh, sons of Jacob or the 12 tribes. We've got 12 apostles and, 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 and brought us the gospel of Christ. Uh, so, I mean, all of this ties together. The pain of Mary was, was in the New Testament with Christ. And even today, the church is the one being persecuted. Now, Jews are being persecuted as well, right? But right now, there's more uh, uh, Christians being martyred than, than, than Jews on a daily basis. So the, and, the, and if you study church history, there's always been martyrdom in the church of Jesus Christ. So uh, since, since the beginning of the formation of the church. So the same kind of suffering that the Jews have gone through, so have the Christians. So I see the tie here. Mary is a personage of the woman of, of Christ, which is both Jews and Gentiles. The issue is faith in Christ. Make sense? Okay? So that's, that's where Mary falls into this personage. And I think what we see here in the Revelation, the book of Revelation, first three chapters was about the church, right? We went all through that. And then God sort of, wraps, I believe, raptures us out of there, and he turns his attention dealing with the, with the old bride, the, the Israel. And then in chapter 19, he turns his attention back to the church when we're seen at the marriage supper of the Lamb and we're clothed in his righteousness. And then we have Armageddon when he delivers Israel. And then he sets up in chapter 20, he sets up the kingdom age, which is us and Israel together in the millennial reign. So that's kind of how the book of Revelation flows. It's the church, it's Israel, it's the church, it's the Israel and, and the church combined in the millennial reign. And that's what I see here really described, if you will, in chapter 12 regarding uh, the woman here being Mary. Mary's a key player. Her name is used throughout the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, uh, and, and is a key player here, okay? Then, of course, we know who Christ is, right? Do I need to spend a lot of time on that? Again, I see the church here as being the watchman on the wall in Isaiah 62. Israel is no longer the watchman on the wall. They didn't watch their wall. That's an Old Testament term. When they built the walls of Jerusalem, they were supposed to put watchmen on the walls, which, which was a spiritual term to keep the infidels and the teaching of the infidels out. And they didn't do that. And that's why as your pastor, I'm an emphatic about us defending the faith of Jesus Christ in this church. 
We, we can't water down the gospel. We can't let the walls down. We, we got to be on the walls. We got to be watchmen for the faith of Christ to the next generation. Okay? And the church has done that over the last 2,000 years. The church is the watchman on the wall, not Israel. Okay? Uh, Revelation 23, uh, 22 7 says, And the spirit of the bride say, Come. Turn to that. I want to, I want to, here's, here's the message of the church in Revelation. Revelation 22 7. Uh, is it? I'm sorry, 2217. Yeah, they're going to say that that reference wasn't correct. Uh, yeah, I, but I said, I said seven. I, I looked at seven. And the spirit and the, of the bride say, Come, let him that heareth say, Come, let him that is a thirst come. Whosoever will let whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. So what is our message as the church? Come. And that's what we've been saying for 2,000 years. Just come. Whosoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. And that's been the diadem, if you will, of the church throughout the ages. And yeah, we sing that all the time. We sang, sang it this morning. Come, now is the time to worship. I mean, that's, that's a popular theme in the church. I thank God it's a popular theme of this church. <coughs> I thank God that this church welcomes anybody that walks through the doors. You know, and, and, and we'll love on them and witness to them. And if they get saved, we'll grow them in Christ. Amen? And that's, that's the ministry of the church. But it's the church doing that. You know, if you look at Judaism, their doors are closed pretty much unless you're a Jew. They're not welcoming whomsoever. It's the church doing that. And that's the message. We're the, again, I go back to the fact that we're the watchmen on the walls. Go back to chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. So Mary here is the first personage of this four-personage uh, uh, chapter. And she brings forth the Son, Jesus Christ. And, of course, uh, what can we say about Christ here? Oh, we'll get to him in a minute. Let's talk about Satan. There appeared to verse 3, there appeared a wonder in heaven, and behold, a red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And you, you can get into all kinds of stuff here. Back when uh, the USSR existed and the, the formulation of the, of the Euro, the, the European Union was being formulated, I learned all kinds of things about who the seven stars were and the seven. Uh, crowns and all this kind of stuff. And I've learned to basically back away from that because none of it seems to fit anymore 40 years later. All the nations we talked about, some of them don't even exist anymore, like the USSR. Okay, so uh, I, I kind of backed away from this. Basically, what I see here is two things it's, that I believe are important. The first in Isaiah chapter 14, which we, we bounced off of this a lot. I don't necessarily want to go back to it. But Satan rebelled in heaven. Satan wants to be God. He says, I'll exalt my throne above the Most High. And when he did that, this text claims that he swept a third of all the angels in heaven out of heaven with him. Now, we don't know how many that is. We have references back in Revelation chapter 9. It's hundreds of, hundreds of millions. A lot of them right now are bound in hell. A bunch are loosed. But eventually in the Revelation, remember when we, when we studied Revelation chapter 9, Satan's going to be given the keys to heaven and let the other minions out. So during this last three and a half years that we're getting ready to enter into with the tribulation period here is going to be pure hell on earth as far as demon demonology is concerned. Okay? And there's going to be hundreds of millions of them running around the earth trying to bring about Satan's rebellion and so he can rule and reign over the earth. And that's, that's what I main thing I read here, okay? The seven heads are, are usually believed to be seven authorities. Uh, there's, if you get into some of the conspiracy theories today, there's seven places around the world that they're going to set up dominions and, and rule the world in seven different uh, providences, if you will. Of course, there's seven continents, so maybe it's one per continent. Who knows? I don't know how it's going to fall out. It, it's immaterial to me. I really don't care how Satan puts his system together. All I know is there's one coming. The one world system is coming. 
And that's about all we really need to know. Uh, I think it's fun to watch as, as countries align themselves. And we used to talk about OPEC and NATO and all this kind of stuff. And, and all that stuff's going to play out somehow. And the UN's going to have some play in it and all this kind of stuff. But I, I don't think Doug has enough duct tape to handle all of it. So I, don't, I personally don't worry about it. I, I, don't, I don't need duct tape. I just know Satan's going to bring it about. But God wins. Jesus wins. Amen. That's all I care about. Okay. Then ten horns are, are again, usually the horns and, and crowns reference providence. They refer, rev, reference authority, uh, rule and reign. This is the political system. Satan is trying to bring about a political system that men and women will fall in line with. And he's going to try to make it look attractive to start with. We know, according to Daniel chapter 9, there's going to be the, the, the seven-year peace pact signed. Okay, so he's going to come to power... Remember the, the, the white horse with the bow and no arrow? He's going to come to, to power without a, a you know, military might. But then we'll see next chapter when he takes control halfway through. He's going to, he's going to cancel the peace pact because it's not working. He's going to take military control over. Everything's going to be the, the mark of the beast. is going to become mandatory and all this type of stuff. And there's going to be dictatorial rule worldwide by Satan himself, ruling and reigning through his, his Antichrist. So that's what's coming. And so, but it's going to be, this, this basically where it reads about the seven heads, the ten horns, and the seven crowns, you think, what I think when I read that is totalitarian government worldwide with one dictator. That's really all you need to know. Satan's going to rule. And he's going to rule as dividing it up into seven crowns, ten horns, and, and, and seven heads. All that's immaterial to me. The dragon's going to rule. Okay? Now, we also see here, it goes, this particular text also goes into the, the battle between he and Michael down in verses 7 and 8. Describes the war that took place in heaven. Uh, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And, uh, of course, Michael's angels won. Satan's angels were thrown out. As a matter of fact, it says there was, no more, there was found no more place in him for heaven. So he was no longer welcome. I thought of that when I was studying this out this week. And actually, I put this lesson together for the last time we were going to get together. It got canceled. So I studied this twice. But the, as I thought about this, you know, Satan is still allowed in heaven at times. Remember Job and other places where he goes and... Yeah, where you been going? Oh, well, I've just been going checking things out here and there, you know, been hearing around. So he still has access to accuse, but he has no dwelling place there. He can't stay real long. He's not welcome. There's never a welcome. Okay? So that's, that's how I read this, basically. You know, that there's no place found for him uh, to exist there. Uh, Verse, I love verse 8, and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So he and, he and the, his, his uh, demons were cast out. And there's no question who we're talking about here, verse 9, that old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceived the whole world. You know, we can go back to uh, Isaiah chapter 14, and it talks about how he deceives the world and, and it deceives men. That's his game plan. Uh, there's no truth in him. When he comes to power, he's going to promise the world is going to be utopia. He's going to solve all the problems, the financial problems, the, the poverty problems, the environmental problems, the nuclear problems. He's going to have an answer for everything. And humanistically speaking, it's going to sound absolutely wonderful how he's going to bring all this stuff together and the people are going to flock to him, particularly when he starts performing a few miracles and, and – uh, gets shot or, or dies and resurrects himself from the dead or whatever he does, uh, people are going to flock to him. I think this world more and more, because so many people today, you hear, well, I'm spiritual. They're just looking for a spiritual event to follow. And when a, when a pope or a, 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 a mullah or somebody comes to power and, and, he, and he dies on, on national television, and then two or three days later he's back alive, Guess what? They're going to flock to him. He's going to have all the power he needs to do whatever he wants. And that's coming. Okay? 
So we just need to, uh, again, I don't fret a lot over this. This war has already happened, but it sets the stage for where we are today with Satan and the demons and, and the spiritual warfare that we're dealing with, okay? And it really introduces Michael here as being God's warrior. He's the angel that led the angels to throw Satan out. And uh, so uh, Michael, thank God, won that battle, right? Verse 10, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's go back and let's talk about one more thing with, with Satan here. Uh, he stead, stood before the woman. Back up in uh, verse 3 and 4. He stood before the woman to devour her child. What happened the minute Jesus was born? King Herod. When the, when the uh, Magi didn't come back and tell him where the baby was born, trust me, he didn't want to go to Bethlehem and worship the child. That wasn't his plan. And the angels told the, 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 the Magi, don't go back and tell him anything. Well, when he found out that they didn't come back, what did he do? He had the every, every, every male child under two years old killed throughout the entire, it's called the, the, the uh, uh, not the burden of Rama, what is it? Uh, there's a term they use for it. Huh? The cry of Rama, something like that. It basically is where the, the whole area around Canaan up there in, 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 in Bethlehem was the, 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 every kid under two years old, every male, male under two years old was, was murdered. And of course, Mary and Joseph, God sent them to Egypt with Jesus in the meantime and used the gold and the silver and the, and, and the myrrh and spices to get them there with the money they needed to get out of there and get to Egypt. But Satan immediately went after the child. So this is just telling us about it here you know, thousands of years later, it's still an issue with Satan when he wanted to destroy the child. So, you know, this, this, this isn't something new with Satan. This, go, this has been going on for since he was cast out of heaven. Uh, let's see here. I want to. We're going to see he's called the red dragon here. OK. References also uh, in, in, in chapter 13, verse one. Uh, the same thing, he's the beast of the sea, and we see that he has seven heads and ten horns upon his horns, ten crowns, okay? And then we also see the scarlet beast in Revelation 17, verse 3, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So this same reference that you see here in chapter 12 is repeated, chapter 13 and chapter 17, all referencing about Satan and his dominion in the last three and a half years of this tribulation period. And we're going to talk uh, next time we're together and we get to chapter 13 about, I believe there's, there's two people coming to power. The first is going to be the false prophet. Uh, I'm personally, my, what I see happening right now, that's probably going to be the Pope of Rome because he's, he's been to, been to uh, the Palestinians now. He's getting ready to come and address the UN. He's stepping up to the plate to try to bring the world together in peace and religion. Okay? And I believe between he and the, the mullahs of, of Islam, we're going to see some major agreements made between what I would call classify the false Christianity of Roman Catholicism and Islam. And I believe we're going to see that come to power here pretty, pretty quickly. Okay? And I tend to lean towards the, the, the Pope of Rome is probably going to be the false prophet. Then, of course, the Antichrist is coming on the scene halfway through the tribulation period, which I believe is the 12th Imam. And the Catholic Church has already set the stage for him to rule and reign uh, and, and, and break the peace pact with Israel. Because the, Jew, the, the, the Islamics are never going to make peace with Israel that's going to last. It's not going to happen. Okay? Roman Catholicism would. Okay? I, believe, I, believe, I believe the Roman, Roman Church would make peace with Israel, and it would last. But, is, but, but Islam is not. There's no way Islam is going to make peace with Israel. It's going to last. So I really see that dual relationship between the Pope and the 12th Imam being significant now in what's taking place here. Okay? So just so you know where I am, am, am on that. Uh, of course, this all goes back, which I've got at the last one here, the new thought, the woman and the beast, Hagar in Genesis chapter 16 
was the mother of Ishmael, the illegitimate child of Abraham, which should have never happened. And that's the centerpiece, if you will, of Islam today. The Arabic world comes from that line. And, uh, of course, Islam is the Arabic form of, of, of Judaism, if you will, going back to Abraham and Ishmael, not Abraham and Isaac, like the Jews. And that's where the spiritual divide starts between Islam and, and the Jews. So that war has gone on since Abraham was immoral, okay? And it's not going to change. So I, I really see that coming into play here in the Revelation in this particular issue here with the Antichrist. So we'll talk a little more about that next time we're together. Uh, back to Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> I thought we were done with him. <laughs> One more slide. Turn to, uh, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. No, second, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Thank you, Carol. And this is in this is happening in, as as we speak. I mean, to me, when I read these type of verses, it's unfolding like a big picture, like a big picture puzzle. Let's start at verse one. Now beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in your mind or be troubled, neither by the Spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as the day of the Lord is present. And I've got in my parentheses wrath there. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be the falling away first, that the man and son of uh, the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And I believe that's a reference to what we're seeing in the Western Church today, where it's kind of falling into the back picture and, and losing its power, and there's a falling away from true uh, witness of God Himself. But this and this son of perdition here. Verse 4, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And that's the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9. We call it the abomination of desolations. When Satan himself sets up his Antichrist in the temple in Jerusalem to worship, be worshipped as God, and throws Judaism out, goes after the, 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 the remnant of the Jews and runs them out of Jerusalem, and he takes over and sets himself up in the temple of God to be ruled as God and desecrates the temple. And again, that's called the abomination of desolations. And that's the ultimate insult as far as God is concerned. That's the ultimate insult. That's when Satan is trying to say, I'll rule and reign. I'll be like God. And it's going to happen. Thousands of years. Thousands and thousands of years he's been trying to make this happen. And it's coming. And, and God's going to let it happen. God's going to let it happen. People are going to have to decide, who am I going to serve? Am I going to serve Jesus Christ and lose my head in martyrdom? Or am I going to serve the, the, the Antichrist? And it's coming. So, you know, and... and, and uh, he's coming with, if you keep reading here, it says he's coming with, let's keep reading, it says he's coming with all signs and wonders. Uh, verse 5, remember you not when I was with you, I told you these things. And now you know what restrains that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery, the mystery of iniquity does already work. And I believe that's saying he's in process putting it together now. Okay? Has been since, since Jesus went back to glory. <clears throat> Only he who now hinders will continue to hinder until he be taken out of the way. And I believe that's a pre-tribulation rapture text. Verse 8, Then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Amen? I mean, you know, we win, right? But notice verse 10. Uh, uh, let's keep reading verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. So that tells you how this Antichrist is coming to power. One of the things that this uh, Muslim that I talked to, and, and Doug and I were, Doug was having a little more exchange than me, but I spent an hour and a half with him out here. 
One of the things he was talking about was all the miracles that are taking place in Islam today. And you know what? That proves nothing. It just proves that Satan's alive and well. If you go back to the Old Testament, the prophets of Baal performed miracles, spoke in tongues, and prophesied. So what's the difference between that and what the prophets of God did? The Nicolaitans traveled to the seven, cer seven churches where the letters were written. Yeah, and did all those miracles, did all those things. And they were prophets of Balaam. That's correct. So, you know, prophecy and miracles mean nothing. Because that's one area that Satan can falsify. They mean nothing. What makes the difference? The spirit behind the miracles. <laughs> Jesus, as Scott says, exactly. That's the only difference. Is who's performing the miracles. And how do you authenticate that? Okay, that's the only issue. So the fact that there's miracles going on means nothing. And we see it right here. Satan's man is going to come to power working mighty signs and miracles and wonders. And the world's going to flock after him. Because they think anything, one miracles has to be of God, right? No, that's not true. Miracles prove nothing. That's why miracles don't save people. That's why we don't have miracle healing services here at this church. I don't want people coming to this church for miracle, miracle healings. I want them to come to your church because they're a sinner and they need to save, be saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's what this pulpit's about. Now, if they want to be healed and we, we, we lay hands on them and we invoke the Holy Spirit and He heals them, praise God for that and we do that. But we're not going to have healing services here. I don't want people coming here to get healed physically. I want them coming here to be healed eternally and spiritually. See, because that's what counts. And I know the Holy Spirit will honor that type of healing. Okay? So that's, that's, that's the, 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 the reason we do what we do here at this church. Okay? Satan's going to come to power working mighty signs and lying wonders. Uh, so hopefully we're done with him now. Yeah. The male child. Could spend all night here. Okay? Mary brought about the Savior through the conception of the Holy Spirit. Revelation 12, uh, 12, 5, and 6 describe his ministry. We all are waiting for this day. She brought forth a male child, verse 5, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And that's referencing to the tribulation, I mean, I mean to the millennial reign. When he comes back and he sits on the throne of David in Jerusalem and rules and reigns for a thousand years, the, the law of Moses is going to be the law of the land. And that was called the rule of the rod of iron. I believe justice is going to be swift. It's going to be just. People are going to lose their lives when they rape. When they commit murder, they're going to be put to death. And it's going to be swift. And we're not going to be, they're not going to be sitting on death row for 25 years waiting to you know, go through 10 different appeals and stuff. Okay? We're not going to have all this junk going on. Okay? Remember, he knows the intents of their heart. <laughs> so he's going to be the righteous judge. It's going to be swift. And they're going to be hauled out and, and stoned or whatever, their, whatever their, their sentence is, and it's going to be done. And he's going to rule and reign with, the, with an iron fist. Okay? I don't know what all that means except righteousness. And for once, we're going to see people living in fear of Almighty God and how it changes their lives. Because trust me, if we enacted the law of Moses tomorrow in this country, there'd be lots of changes quick. And a lot of our kids would get their acts in together or they would be exterminated. You know, they used to take the rebellious son out and stone him. There'd be a lot of stonings going on to start with. These kids would either get the, get the hint or they'd cease to exist. Now, that's not popular teaching. But it's biblical, and that's what's going to happen in the millennial reign. That's going to be the law of the land. That's what parents are going to be teaching their kids. 
You go out and get involved in immorality. You go out and get involved in drugs and the stuff that's going on today. You lose your life. Period. We don't put you in jail. We stone you. You're, you're a disgrace to your parents. You're a disgrace to your God. We're not going to allow it to happen. That's what God meant in the Old Testament. That's what the law of Moses is about. Righteousness. At any cost. Even the loss of your child. Particularly that rebellious one that's breaking your heart anyhow. Okay? So, I mean, it, again, it's not popular teaching, but that's where we're headed. That's what, this, that's what I see being taught here. Okay? He's going to rule with the rod of iron. Her child was caught up to God. What's that telling us? Well, he was crucified. They rejected him. Fulfillment, of, again, of Daniel chapter 9. Messiah was cut off. He ascended back up into heaven. That's where he is now. So this is prophetic. He's in glory today, sitting at the right hand of the Father as our advocate, right? So, I mean, here John wrote about it. And to his throne. Where, where's his throne? His throne's in heaven. He just returned home. That's all he did. Verse 6 is yet to take place. I think it's a prophecy of the tribulation. The woman fled into the wilderness. Now, actually, this is, this, this is a dual prophecy because in 70 AD, when Titus came in and destroyed Israel, she fled. Many went to Petra, remember, in, in Masada. You know the history of the Jews at Masada, okay? And, and they fled. So this is all part of that deal. Uh, in the tribulation period, if you read Matthew 24, and, I, and again, I've said before from this pulpit, the minute you put the church in Matthew 24, you no longer get truth. Now you'll end up with post-tribulation rapture theory. And Jesus was talking to the disciples, which were Jews, and telling them what was getting ready to happen to the Jewish nation in the tribulation period. So Matthew 24 is about the Jews. It's not about Christians. It's not about the church. But if you read that, it's talking about they're going to have to flee. It talks about the women don't want to be pregnant during that period. They don't want to do it in the wintertime. And you don't go back to your house and get anything. You just run. That's when Satan sets himself up in the temple and turns everything against Israel. And I believe Israel's got a heartache coming when Satan sets himself up, trashes their temple, trashes the peace treaty, and goes after them instantly. And it's going to happen in a day when he decides to take over three and a half years into the tribulation period. And Israel's going to flee into the desert. I was listening to, I uh, forget the name of the Christian show, but it's about Israel. And it was talking about uh, they had just done a tour into the wilderness and how desolate and wilderness really is south of Jerusalem down to the Sinai Peninsula where Israel's gone a few times, where they wandered for 45 years in the, in the wilderness. It is a desolate nothingness, rocky caves, uh, I mean, just unbelievable area down there. And that's where they're going to go. Most people believe, most theologians believe they're going to end up back at Petra, Petra and at Masada. Probably the repeat of 70 AD. But the, the Jews are going to flee Israel in mass as Satan goes after them. And notice here, it says that uh, God's going to, going to, the woman will be fed, flee, flee to the wilderness where she hath a place prepared by God that they should feed her there. 1,203 score days. Notice, what's that again? What's that? Three and a half years. They're going to be in that desert for three and a half years. Now, I, you have to ask yourself, all right, is Satan that stupid that he can't figure out where they are? And he's got the military power of the entire world and he can't go after them? But what's this say? God's prepared a place for him. So... All we can say is supernaturally, God's going to protect them. How's that going to happen? I don't know. But God does, and He can take care of it. You know, He can make them invisible for all we know. Who knows? But God's going to protect His people. And, and I don't fret over how this stuff is going to happen because God, you know, as we read about Mary conceiving in her, in her womb, what does it say? With God, all things are possible. 
So would you have any problem with anything else? I don't. I don't fret over this stuff. I really don't. I read it and I leave it alone. They're going to go into the wilderness. That's what, that we know. And God's going to feed them there. And God's going to protect them there till this thing's over. Three and a half years. Tells us exactly how long they're going to be there. Okay? Now, I kind of like the idea that when the 144,000 are witnessing to them, they can tell them that. If you're one of those Jews that end up in the wilderness, don't fret. It's only three and a half years. <laughs> and God will protect you. Guarantee you. Because that's what the Scripture says. Yeah, again, you, you have to ask yourself, well, wait a minute. Can't Satan go wipe them out? Not if God's involved. <laughs> Nothing he's going to do is going to hurt them. Okay? That's a hope for them. So, you know, that's all part of it. Uh, we talked about the abomination of desolation. Uh, da, 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 da. Here's the, the bottom line. And I've already mentioned this, but I believe this is what this text, this entire text is really about. I believe this text is setting the stage for this right here. And we're going to see it in the next chapter. Envision we're at that prep precipice right now, three and a half years into this tribulation period. There's been false peace. We've seen the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse uh, revealed. We've seen the, the, uh, the, the, the seal judgments. We've seen the trumpet judgments. We've seen two of the three woes take place. Okay? And we're right at that prep precipice now at three and a half years when everything's getting ready to change. False prophet's going to come on the scene. Probably he's already on the scene. He probably comes on the scene at the beginning of this tribulation period. Uh, I can see the Pope stepping up to the plate and being the, 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 the guy that brings the peace pact together between Israel and, 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 and the world. I can really see the Pope playing an integral part in that. Okay? And then he would set himself up as the false prophet. And he would tell everybody about how wonderful things are going to be when Satan's coming to power. And he'd be in bed with Satan. Okay? And then halfway through, all of a sudden the Islamics say, time out, the 12th Imam's here. This is Messiah. He needs to be on the throne. And I believe right now this is a recent picture of the Pope in Jerusalem in front of the Islamic mosque, the Dome of the Rock, with a bunch of Islamics. And again, he's coming, I think, in September to, to speak to, to the UN. Right around the blood moon. The blood moon. <laughs> Just coincidence. Along with, uh, along with uh, Jay Helm, right? Right along that same time, September 15th. <laughs> Just coincidence. Folks, we may be living in the day, in the next three months, when we're raptured out of here and it all starts, okay? The, you know, I, I know most of us here tonight are all about that. That's fine with me. <laughs> the, 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 then I won't say that on, on, <laughs> on the Internet. But, you know, it would be fine with me. I mean, I love our church. I love you guys. But if we can meet, have our next worship service in glory, I got no problem with that, okay? <laughs> no problem at all. <laughs> Let's go home. I'm ready any time. But I really believe this is coming real soon. I think we see it coming. It's, it's, it's unfolding like a big pit puzzle. Uh, we got the geopolitical systems taking place. With, I mean, even to the point that the, the G7 is going to protect global warming now. So we've got it all, we've got it all figured out, you know. Uh, so no matter what happens, they're going to take care of the world for us while we're gone. But uh, that's the folly of mankind, right? <laughs>